Uh, good morning, everybody. It's a very nice pre uh, pleasure to have here today with us Professor Mark Gray from Hay, from the Georgia Tech, uh, Georgia Institute of Technology, United States, Atlanta. Uh, I think Professor Hay has a very like outstanding CV. He has an education in ecology and an and evolutionary biology, zoology, and I think that his most like uh, amazing contributions come from the chemical ecology field. So as we'll see in his presentation, he will show us some of his data and his contribution on our understanding of these like relationships, this ecological relationships in coral reefs. So I hope you all enjoy his presentation. And I want to thank you, Mark, because he's making a, a quick visit to our to, to Sao Paulo in his way back home. He was here visiting uh, the Federal University of Rio Grande do Norte. So it's very nice to have you here with us. Thank you. It's nice to get to know you better, too. And I hope you enjoy and come back soon. Okay? Let me give you this. And I have just to make one small announcement in Portuguese. Okay, thank you. Um, what I want to do today is, is go through some of our work on coral reefs to sort of tell you what the status of reefs is and to argue that we need to be more um, aggressive in some way about fixing things rather than just studying the loss. Okay, and what I'm hoping um, that we've started to do is is um, look for what I'll call little ways that we can change things that have a big effect instead of big ways that we do stuff that don't work very well, okay? And in some respects, what I wanna do is think about biomedical intervention. In other words, if, if you have cancer and you go to the doctor, you don't want them to tell you to eat more vegetables and exercise. That's good advice, but it won't cure cancer, okay? And so what I think we're doing with conservation is saying let's back off and nature will fix itself, and I think it would. But I'm gonna show you we don't back off. There are a lot more people on Earth now than there were when I was born. I'll show you this graph in a second. but. We need to, ha to have ways that we intervene and fix nature instead of just saying, let's back off, because I don't see any indication that we're backing off, okay? Um, and so here's kind of a, a summary of what I want to emphasize. This is what we'll call Biosphere One. It's the only one we know we truly have, okay? And it's the only place we know we can live. This is all the atmosphere at atmospheric pressure in the earth piled up in one place as a visual thing. This is all the water, okay? And so every day we run our cars, put out fumes, put out factories, we breathe it, we flush the toilet, we drink it. We get most of that cleaned up via ecosystem services. I mean, we have sewage treatment plants and things that's really not as important as nature sort of fixing this when things throw, flow through wetlands, stuff, we clean a lot of that up. Here's how many people were on earth when I was born. Here's how many people are on earth as of yesterday, crudely. Um, there are 3.2 times as many people on earth as when I was born. So this is not happening slowly. This is happening very rapidly, okay? Um, this is something called Biosphere 2, which you may have seen the stupid movie about, but um, this is the real thing. And it's basically in 1980, so a long time ago, they built this in the Arizona desert. There's a 
coral reef in it. There's an ocean in it. There's a savanna in it. They put about 4,000 species in there. They spent $200 million at 1980 dollars, which would be a lot more today. And the goal was to seal this up and have a big kind of terrarium that you could keep eight people who were supposed to live in there for two years, grow their own crops, you know, treat their own waste, etc. After eight months, they pulled them out. And one of the people said, basically, we stuff suffocated, starved and went mad. So I'm at an engineering, famous engineering university. And if you say, okay, let's mess up the planet, we'll just engineer a solution. So for $25 million per person in $1980, we couldn't engineer what we get for free. Okay, so I think we ought to keep this system working because we don't know how to build this system. Okay. Um, and the other thing I want to point out is we've seen lots of what we'll call tipping points where, and, and think about water, it's a solid at a certain temperature. And so we go from negative 10 to negative five, it's fine. We go from negative five to negative two, it's fine. We go a couple of degrees higher and all of a sudden it's a liquid and we're swimming rather than walking. There's a lot of ecological processes that are like that as well. We push the system and it's fine. We push it a little more and it fundamentally changes. And I'll show you some of that today. We don't want it changing on the biosphere level fundamentally because we don't know how to deal with that, okay? And so um, I'm gonna argue that a marine system is a particularly good one to study because it's a great integrator. It's 70% of the surface of the world. If you think of organisms as sort of biosensors that tell us whether things are okay or not, right at the terrestrial marine interface, we have coral reefs. They're one of the most diverse systems. So there's lots of sensors out there that are telling us whether things are okay or not okay. And they're not today telling us things are great. Okay. Um, and so, you know, this is right at the interface, lots of biodiversity. Uh, we've seen lots of tipping points on coral reefs around the world. And here's just an example. This is sort of the Caribbean and what it looked like in the late seventies. This is what it looked like by 2000. This is the coral cover in the Caribbean on average and, and sort of the number of studies, but we've lost 80, 90% of the coral cover in the Caribbean since I started studying coral reefs. And I didn't do it myself, other people, I didn't destroy all of this. Okay, but in other words, we're losing a lot of biodiversity and structure and function. Now, it's not just the Caribbean, this is the Pacific and sort of the distribution, whether reefs had 10, 20, 30, 40, 100%, et cetera, coral cover. And this is the entire Indo-Pacific region uh, in sort of the, the late 1980s. And this was in the early 2000s. You'd lost half of the corals throughout the entire Pacific, okay? Shortly after this, you lost half of everything on the Great Barrier Reef in one year, 2015, 16, okay, to bleaching. And what we're getting and these, these two pictures, and I'll come back to these, are a place we worked in Fiji. These two pictures are taken 200 meters apart. One of these is a coral reef, lots of coral, lots of fish. The other one is this algal covered slime. And this is a fished region and that's an unfished area. Okay. Um, there's lots of, well, we'll call it scientific discussions about What's causing this? Is it overfishing? Is it nutrient addition? Is it global change? And I would argue the answer is yes to all of those things. And that we need to switch from saying which one of these is causing it to saying what can we do about it? Are there ways to fix it instead of just cataloging the demise? And 
to give you some idea of, of what's going on with some of this, uh, we know that herbivores are really crucial in consuming seaweeds and keeping them from competing with corals. And um, these are a couple of pictures from Belize on the Belizean Barrier Reef in the early 1980s. I would see schools of these achenthurids that were 500 in a school all the time. You don't, you rarely see that anymore. Uh, parrotfish, and they're called parrotfish because they have these fused beak in front and they can basically bite down into the coral, grind it up. There's algae that grow down into the coral. They can get that out. These guys produce half of the sand in the tropics. Okay, so when you save your money to fly to those white, beautiful sand beaches, you're sitting on parrotfish poop, okay? <laughs> and, uh, but they keep the reef safe for the corals. And here's an example. This is, again, in uh, Belize. Back in the 80s, Sarah uh, Lewis put up some fences around a shallow area. Ten weeks later, you went from sort of filamentous algae and scattered corals up to this sort of brown algal bed. When you remove those fences, and the algae just overgrew and killed corals, when she removed those fences in one to two days, that 10 weeks of accumulated biomass was all removed by herbivores. Okay. Um, what we're doing now as humans is fishing on these reefs, and we're doing a worldwide herbivore removal. This is the um, in Fiji at the fish market. All of these are herbivores. And um, we're kind of doing a big experiment, but doing it worldwide without controls and without replicates. Um, and I'm going to jump around a bit on this. This is Aquarius. It's an underwater lab in Florida. And we've used this several times, and it allows us to work at depth and to stay there. We do really one dive for 10 days. You dive down from the surface, you don't come up till 10 days later. You live in this thing, and I'll, I'll show you this in a second, but it allowed us to do a lot of experiments at about 20 meters deep because we had enough bottom time to just stay there. So we could dive 12 hours a day you're safe as long as you don't come up. If you come up, you die. So, uh, but at any rate, it's kind of like a, a big school bus that's down on the bottom. It's got a hole in the bottom of it, and you just come and go through that hole. Um, because you're at pressure, there's so much more oxygen in there that you can't do anything with, with fire. You can't, like, cook something. Um, and a lot of things, we can't take anything down with us. We have to give them everything and they investigate it and they take it down because some things like deodorant with that extra oxygen and under pressure will explode. Okay. And so uh, it's, it's, they're very careful about what goes in there. Um, back here in the back of this, there are six bunks in a place about the size of this table. So you're sleeping on shelves basically there's a little eating area all this stuff is things that monitors the air to keep us alive etc um you know we can eat you can watch the fish watch us eat um <laughs> they they use this to train the astronauts for spacewalks because it's it's very like you're in space you go outside you you need to have some kind of breathing apparatus and things on and the space guys leave this uh, freeze-dried food and stuff for us down there. If you ever get the chance to try it, just do one packet and share it among a bunch of people. You don't, you don't want a meal of this. It's not very good. Um, the other thing here is that because you can't come up safely, um, there are little roadways built all around with these ropes that guide us to different places. And if you get lost, you can find one of those ropes and they have a little arrow embedded in them that says this way to safety. And there are little filling stations around. We go out with double tanks on and you can stay out all day because when your tanks get low, you just swim into this little pod and you stick a, a tube into it and you fill your tanks back up. Okay. So it's very nice. To, 
So what we did there was build 32 of these big two by two by one meter tall cages, and we caged in different species of fish to say, is diversity of, is, is herb, herbivory important, or is it important to have different kinds of herbivores in there? And so what we did is had these with two parrots, a parrot and a surgeon, two surgeons, nobody. Okay, and we ran those for two years for about 10 months each time. And basically here's what we found. I'm not gonna show you data from some of these things. I'm gonna skip through them. If you had these different fish in there, which are common on the reef in the Caribbean, you had encrusting coral and algae and a little bit of filaments. And encrusting coral and algae, these red things that grow like paint on the rocks, stimulate coral settlement. Okay, so the, the larvae of corals recognize that as a safe place to go. If we remove this fish, these areas were overgrown by filaments. If we put that fish back in and remove this one, um, they were overgrown by fleshy red algae. If we put that back and remove this one, they were overgrown by, by browns, okay? So it wasn't enough to have X amount of herbivores. You had to have the equivalent of goats and cows and, and horses to keep this clean. And that was, was caused by differential ability to withstand the chemical defenses that the algae made. Some of those fish could eat compound X, some of them couldn't, okay? And so um, this, the Caribbean is pretty simple ecosystem. It's not real diverse. The Pacific is much more diverse. So we wanted to try it there. We don't have an underwater lab there, so we did it a different way, but we're off in Fiji now. Um, and what we wanted to know is, one, is that diversity still important in a, a number of different ways? And we're also just sort of asking, this is where we lived when we were in Fiji. This is the mayor of Batua village. Um, we're living in a tiny Fijian village. Um, your carbon footprint is almost zero. And we're trying to save coral reefs. And we're asking these people not to fish in some areas and not to eat as well so that this is Atlanta where I live so that we can light up everything, air condition everything, drive to work, fly to Fiji. In other words, when I'm in Atlanta, my carbon footprint is the size of this room. When I'm in Fiji, it's like that, okay? Are we asking Illy here to give up food so that we can fly from here and have a nice vacation with nice coral reefs? Um, but I would also say these guys understand that nature is providing stuff for them and they want to save that as much as possible, okay? Um, now, this is um, Vitua, the little village we lived in. We lived right there for about five years. This is an area they do not fish. This is an area that they fish that's 200 meters away. Same for these other villages. I could show you the same thing up, up and down here. So fishing here made a huge difference despite global change, despite pollution, despite all those other things, just not removing the herbivores kept the reefs much more. Um, and can we, yeah, can you make the video run on that? And this is just to show you, this is their marine protected area. This is their fished area. And these were the most dramatic differences I've ever seen in fished and unfished places. And part of that is because they they uh, enforce it so well. They live right there. If you live in the village, there's 180 people in the village. If you go out and fish, we know it. And at that week's village meeting, we all go, she fished, bad thing, okay? And the minister brings it up in church and everybody thinks you're a bad person. It works really well. If you're a visitor and not associated with the village and you went there, there would be these two huge Fijians that met you on shore, very nicely said, I know you're a visitor, you can't fish here, please don't do this again. If you did it tomorrow, they would break both your legs, lay you by the road and call the police. 
Okay, so it's very well enforced. Okay, and it, it makes a big difference. They enforce it a lot better than we do in the U.S. Okay. Um, now, so both our experiments and a lot of other people's have said that loss of herbivores allows seaweed to damage and suppress and replace corals. We wanted to know which seaweeds were most damaging, which corals were most susceptible. In other words, can we save certain ones? Can we work on getting rid of others? And what mechanisms are involved? Is some of it chemical? And so this is Doug Rasher, one of my PhD students at the time. And Doug worked out ways that we made these little concrete ice cream cones and that we could glue al uh, corals in and transplant them around. So we used four species of common corals, eight species of common algae. Uh, we could put those corals in these little ice cream cones, put this rope around them and, and put different algae in there. And so you had, you could say, how does this coral do well or do poorly when it's next to this alga? And we would grow them out on the reef in these coral tables. Okay, and we could set it up with lots of different species, lots of different combinations, and ask what happened over time, okay? And uh, what we would do is go out periodically and pull the algae away and say, is it bleached or not bleached, where it was in contact with that? And then to try to make sure we weren't fooling ourselves. In other words, when you do this, you, you sort of want to see an effect. And I thought we were fine, but um, you know, some reviewers suggested that we should do something else as well. So we bought these $40,000 things that tell us whether or not it's white. Okay. It, really, it's, it's an underwater fluorometer that measures photosynthesis. And so we could say, how much do we think this is bleached, just visually, you know, I don't know, 20% 20, 20 of the coral. And we could regress that against these readings of what was the reading when it wasn't in contact and what was it? And it's very tight regression. It works out pretty well. So we're not lying is what I'm telling you. And here's what it looked like. And some of these algae, this is uh, Dictyota, and this is after a week of contact. This is Chlorodesmus. This is after two days of contact. Okay, so some of these are killing this really rapidly. Um, and this kind of is hard to see, but down here are um, those eight species of algae. They're all lined up in the same order. Don't worry about what they are right now. This stipple bar is the control, okay? And so, and this is the amount of bleaching and this is the amount of photosynthesis. And so what goes on is we've got some seaweeds that cause heavy bleaching on all the corals and it caused photosynthesis to drop dramatically on those corals. And we've got some in the middle that caused some bleaching and some suppression, but weren't particularly bad. And then we've got some over on this end, some of the common browns, sargassum turbinaria, that didn't do much at all in terms of bleaching. That doesn't mean they're not slowing the growth rate due to shading and abrasion and other things. But we also wanted to test if this was done by abrasion and so we made fake algae out of trash bags and things like that and put it in it didn't have any effect okay so it's not abrasion it looks like chemistry to us and so um, we can go out and take those algae and extract them okay get the lipophilic compounds out rotavap that down put those crude extracts in gels at natural concentrations, wrap those around the coral and say, okay, what if we just put the chemistry on there? Okay, and, and we have a control of this with the solvent, but not the chemistry. And when we do that, um, this, this is what happened with the live algae after, I think, 20 days. And this is what happened with just the extracts after 24 hours. Okay, and so some of these are having much more an effect. They're, they're really suppressing photosynthesis much more than the live algae did. And that's probably because the live algae have some of these compounds on the outside, but we've extracted everything. Okay, so we redid this just extracting the surface by using less polar compounds and got very similar results. Okay, 
Um, so a lot of this is caused by chemistry of some sort. Okay? And by working with chemists at Georgia Tech, Julia Kubinak's group, we could go through, and I, I won't explain all of this. Let me just say what we're doing is taking the chemistry, spreading it out along a polarity gradient and cutting that up and testing different parts of it. And we keep doing those bioassays. And again, this is all done in the field, it's all done on live corals out on the reef itself. And we end up with certain number of compounds that we can identify that are active and that are causing that negative effect on the corals. So we know it's chemical. There were a number of other compounds that degraded on us that are also active, but we can't tell you what they are. Uh, I'm, I'm happy when I get a few out, okay? <laughs> um, now, so from this, um, I'll say allelopathy is common. We've run about, we're probably up to 70 of these tests or something now, and about 75% of those have shown chemical effects on the corals. Um, you know, algal coral interactions are species specific. Some corals are more susceptible, some are less. Some algae are very deterrent, some are not. Uh, there's a general trend in, in that. I can say a cropper, which is really important in the Pacific, is very susceptible to this. Parietes, which is kind of the last thing left when reefs degrade, is very not susceptible to they're very tough. Um, now, after doing that, we wanted to say, does diversity matter? Again, back to what we did in the Caribbean. On these reefs are 29 species of common fish that eat algae, okay? I'm gonna show you that four of those are really important for macroalgae. The rest of them are eating filaments and stuff. They're not as big a deal. And so uh, again, Doug set up, we would transplant a bunch of algae out in front of these cameras, video them, then uh, come back in and Doug spent days watching every bite on everything and looking at 20 something thousand bites, I think, and who, who did them and, and how. And here's what goes on. These two fishes ate the browns. This fish ate one of the browns and some of the reds. This one fish, this is chlorodesmus, that green thing that, that killed the corals really quickly and it has some really nasty cytotoxic compounds in it. These fish, would swim around in pairs. And when they saw chlorodesmus, they would start shaking in the water column. They were so excited. And they'd go down on the bottom and go <laughs> until it was gone. And then they'd kind of look at the rest of it and go, okay, I'm not eating anything else. And they'd swim off. So this one species is the only one that is eating that nasty algae. But we could go to the villagers and say, you've got really damaged areas where you've caught everything, and you've got these beautiful areas where you haven't, and you know these support more fish, and those spill over into your area to catch. You're, you're catching the interest off your savings account. Don't eat these four species, and all of your area might be a lot better, okay? We've got only mixed results on whether they actually do that or not, but they're thinking through that. But again, this is one of those things where you don't have to say, you should starve so that my kids can come to the tropics and see a nice coral reef. You can say, look, you can, you've got 29 species. Eat some of them, leave these four alone, and leave some of the others alone, but you, know, but you can eat. It'll be fine. Okay, and so the bottom line on this is there are a few fish that are chainsaws. They can go through and remove the bigger algae once they're there. There's another whole group that are only eating the filaments and once big things get there, if you, if you get these fish back, they're not gonna remove sargassum and turbinaria and some of these others. So you've gotta keep both at some level and what controlled a lot of this was the chemistry. Okay, that determine who ate what. Now, I wanna switch a little bit um, and say, so we know diversity matters for fish 
in the Caribbean and in the Pacific. Okay. Uh, what about coral diversity? Because we're losing a lot of corals. Does it make any difference? In the, in the Caribbean, we've only got about 60 species. So if you lose a few, that's a big proportion. In the Indo-Pacific, we've got 600 species. So you lose a few. Big deal, right? Maybe, maybe not. Okay, so Cody Clements, one of my past students and present postdoc, worked out a way to transplant corals really in a novel way so that we could not only say where they were living or dead, but we could weigh them every few months, but to do it out on the reef, not in a lab. And so Cody worked out a way of uh, taking bottle caps, turning them upside down and cementing them into these little sort of chess boards that we built out there. And then we would glue corals into the neck of those bottles. And so we can screw them in and out and make different mixes of corals, different densities of corals, et cetera. And play that one for me, will you? Um, so we would have, all of these are numbered and we would weigh all of them out on the reef, um, glue them in these things, run around and you can, you can see him screwing them in and out on some of these tables. Um, and so we could go back every few months, unscrew them, weigh that coral, 30 seconds later, it's back in the water. Because we do this standing out on the reef, we build a little platform. And so, um, and this, run this one if you would. This is uh, what it looked like once we got it set up. Uh, and Cody has now built hundreds of these. This is like being done, buffet. like what? Like a buffet. Yeah, yeah, it's like a very nice restaurant for, and, and unfortunately it is a nice restaurant for a few fish will come along and eat too many of these and drive us crazy. Um, but when we did that in Fiji, what we found out and what I'm showing you here is the dark bars are monocultures of these three different species. So everything on that plot is that one species or it's a mix of the three species. Okay, so it's, it's a mix of these at density X or it's only this at density X, only that at density X, et cetera. And after four months, we got significantly more growth out of every single one of these species when they were with other species than when they were by themselves, okay? Um, and this is the total of all of those. So you're getting about 50% more coral growth on each of those tables if it's in a mixed species group than in a single species group. And there's, there's always the chance that what you've done is just put one really super species in there and that's why you're getting more growth okay but even the best growing species grew better when it was in many when it was surrounded by other species than it was surrounded by itself okay and this is after 16 months we still had most of that although this acropora started to to do as well, I think what's gonna go on on these is in the early stages, there's something facilitatory about this. They're helping each other out. Then you may have one really good competitor that starts taking over over time, okay? Um, now, the other part of this, we could go through and say, how much depth was there on each of these corals? And there was, um, you know, often more, more depth when they were in monocultures and in polycultures. Now that could be because disease is spreading more easily. Um, but we also got in at least one of these, a lot more seaweed cover in a monoculture than in the polyculture. Okay, so there's something about having other corals around that made these function better. Now we wanted to redo that in, in French Polynesia and we were a little worried that maybe this is because we pick three species and those three work that way, but diversity in general doesn't work that way. And so we picked nine species in French Polynesia and we grew them either as single species, randomly drawing three of the nine, randomly drawing six of the nine or doing it as all nine of them there. And what we got 
after, uh, again, three months, you get significantly more growth at three and six species than you do at one. And it looks like it's tailing off. Um, if we look at tissue mortality, you get more death with one species and you get a lot less with the multi ones. And you see much of that after seven months as well. So, and we've also done this where we looked at the individual species and said, is this because of inter versus intra specific competition? Is it because, you know, species X is at, is, is competing with everybody that's just like them when it's a monoculture and they're competing with some that are a little different when it's a polyculture. And so we can make monocultures with six individuals or eight individuals or 12 individuals. We don't get differential growth there. It is not intraspecific competition. It's something else. And we're working on what that something else is. But I, I suspect, and we're working on the microbiome stuff now, that it may be that many of these corals have some chemical defenses against pathogens and that when you're by yourself, you have that, that one type of defense. And when something gets around it, it sweeps through. But when you're with others, you're getting sort of a multi-drug cocktail that's out there and it may work better. I can't tell you that that's what's going on. We're working on that. We may be able to tell you in a few months. Um, now, um, <clears throat> you know, so coral species richness is critical, just like for fish. We get greater growth, less death, and less seaweed competitors when we mix species. Uh, that's true in Fiji, and that's true in French Polynesia. Uh, it was true for one versus three species in Fiji and for one, three, six, nine, but it tended to saturate. Okay, once we got to the nine, and it's probably um, size specific, if we made those things bigger, that curve might be big and different. But that means that when we lose species, it makes it more likely that we'll lose more species. In other words, there's something about richness that is making reefs work better, okay? Um, now, let's do this. Can we do the video again? Sorry. Um, one last question, and this is something new we're doing right now in French Polynesia. Uh, sea cucumbers are something I've always wanted to work on, but I could never find enough of them to see what they do. And there's a place here, all of these black things are sea cucumbers. Most places around the world where I've been diving, I could find one, or maybe I could find five or six on a dive. Here there's seven per square meter across this area. It's one of the only, and it's, it's all one species, and it's one of the species that's not good to collect and eat. Okay, so it's, it's a trash one that's left. And, um, so what I really want to do, we know that, that when you add wolves back to systems, big predators, the systems change, okay? It's really important to have those big predators in there. It's true for sea otters, it's true for killer whales. What about from the bottom up instead of the top down? What about the janitors, the guys that clean up? You know, during COVID, we found out it was really important to have the people collecting trash and to have the people cleaning the countertops and the floors. These are the janitors of coral reefs, but we've removed all of them from most reefs around the world. And so sea cucumbers have been harvested very aggressively for 200 years, okay? And <clears throat> the present harvest kicked up a lot in, the, in about the 1960s. Um, we're presently removing 200 million a year worldwide, okay, 10 tons of dried mass, and the dry mass is 4 to 10% of the wet mass. Um, nobody really knows what natural densities are. I can find old papers in the 50s and 60s from remote areas saying that sometimes they had 50 per meter square, okay? Seven per meter square, this place where we're working, is the most I've seen in my lifetime. Okay, and it's in some bays, not others. When I talk to old Fijians, they say it used to be like this everywhere. 
when I was a child, but it, you know, they harvested them. Um, often, sea cucumbers are not like fish. They're external fertilizers. They don't move around much. And so when you go through and harvest these, and they're just laying on the bottom, you can just pick them all up. They don't run away. 60 years later, in places where they've harvested ever, no recovery. Okay, and so they're not, you, you could go through and remove 10% of them every 10 years or something, it would probably be fine. But if they're spewing eggs and, and sperm out into the water column and there's one over there and there's one 100 meters that way, those eggs and sperm are never gonna get together, okay? And so um, they've been called a, it, that it's a mining operation not a fisheries operation. You're, you're taking the gold out of the mountain, it's not gonna replace itself, okay? And so, um, you know, we wanted to ask, what happens when you remove those? And, um, <clears throat> you know, do sea cucumbers matter? Um, in these areas, we've got a lot of these um, thicket forming corals. And in the base of those, there's a lot of damselfish that kill off the base of the coral and grow algal gardens on the base of that. And I've always assumed those were um, kind of parasites, you know, that were damaging the coral. It's a bad thing. Maybe not. Let me, let me show you here in a second. These corals are supposedly ones that break up during storms, roll across the sand, and reestablish sitting there in the sand. Now, when we put them in the sand there, this is what happens to them. Two to six days later, they get a white band around the base and that grows up and kills the whole thing, okay? So this notion of rolling around and establishing on the sand is kind of questionable to me in this place, okay? Now, if, yeah, run, run both of these at once if you would. So we built a bunch of cages and we kept the sea cucumbers out or we put them in. And in those cages, we transplanted in these corals either in contact with the sediment or with the filamentous algae at the base that separated them or to control for maybe we're harming them when we break them somewhere else. We also broke them with the filamentous algae at the base but then buried it deep enough so that that was in contact with the sand. And what happened is um, at the, yeah, see, is there one over there as well? This is the same thing again. So the ones that were in contact all, all bleached and died like this. I'm gonna go to the next and show you the data here finally. Okay, we'll come back to this in a second. Um, this is the percent tissue death if, um, if we had removed sea cucumbers, and this is if we had not removed sea cucumbers. So having the sea cucumbers there makes a huge difference, okay? This is, and that's that's the percent death when we're holding this up after a few days saying, okay, I think there's 30% dead or 100% dead. If we instead looked at, at just the whole colony died, there was 2% death if sea cucumbers were there over 45 days and there was 30% death if we had removed sea cucumbers. So sea cucumbers are doing something that facilitates coral survival here or suppresses pathogens. If we, in those cages, if we extracted the coral just in, and we're just doing the water soluble extract. So we're breaking up the coral, shaking it in water, using that water to do bioassays in the lab with a coral pathogen. That coral, if the sea cucumbers are absent, it suppresses the pathogen growth by about 20%. If the sea cucumbers are there, it suppresses it by nearly 40%. So there's something more potent. We did try to do the chemistry on this. We got nothing, it degrades on us. So um, now the other part of this that's going on, remember we've overfished reefs worldwide. When we do that, we get a lot of brown algal growth. We get a lot of sargassum turbinaria, dictyota that, that starts growing. Um, in recent years, there's been huge trouble with sargassum floats and stuff coming into beaches and stuff. You can smell it for miles away, it stinks. Um, 
This is a, a recent science paper where they've looked through the years and you can see that, uh, you know, early on there wasn't that much. And then, you know, more recently there's been a huge increase in sargassum that's out in the Sargasso Sea coming into beaches in the Caribbean, etc. Now, we don't have a Sargasso Sea in Fiji, but we get the same thing going on and it's, it's from overfishing these areas and having a lot of brown algae that grow and it tears off during storms and it floats in close to shore. And there's a huge amount of that going on. If we look here where we're working in, in Morea, and this is a, a gradient coming out from shore um, toward here and that's zone one, two, three, or four. So this is back near shore. If the sea cucumbers are there, uh, this is the amount of organic content of the sediment. If the sea cucumbers are not there, if we remove them, you see there's a lot more of that algae, a lot more organics back in near shore than away from shore where those sargassum things are coming in. Um, if we look at sea cucumber density, there's a lot more back where there's more sargassum. So they, they are back there being little vacuum cleaners that clean up this stuff when it comes through. If we look at tissue mortality, if we remove sea cucumbers and plant corals back there, it's very high where you're getting the sargassum input and it drops off as you move out where you're getting less of that, okay? And so higher organics are feeding more sea cucumbers. That leads to more coral death if the sea cucumbers are removed. So if we're adding organics because those used to be stored in fish, we ate that and now it's stored in seaweeds that are tearing off and going back into shore we are now out there doing we've we've gone let me go back we've gone further out here where you don't get the seaweeds accumulating and we've added seaweeds to some areas and done those coral implants and we get the same pattern here if we add those sea rotting seaweeds something kills the corals we're trying to work out what we think it's a pathogen, we think it's microbial, but we're not sure we're working on it. Um, but we're also redoing these experiments by adding tacos and adding rice and just saying, is it just organics or is it something about the seaweeds, okay? And so uh, we've also looked at the coral microbiomes and stuff in these areas and where it's infected and where it's not. I'm not gonna talk too much about this, but the microbiomes obviously differ down here versus up here on healthy stuff. And they differ if we put in sea cucumbers or don't in the sediment microbiome. Um, now, here's what I think has gone on. And here's what I'm talking about when I say long ecological fuses. I think not only are we doing things today, but I think we did things 100 years ago that are causing things to happen today. So, you know, we went off in sailing ships and we collected sea cucumbers like crazy and they're selling them in the Asian market. And we've removed the fishes. They're not eating the seaweeds. Those are ending up in the sediments and, and enriching the whole area. And it's causing coral mortality in some way. And there are other examples like that. The, sea, the killer whale story that I, some of you may know killer whales started eating um, sea otters back in the 90s and just wiped out sea otters pretty much for all of Alaska. And what really went on is after the Second World War, the Japanese and the Russians had unemployed men and extra ships. And they re-outfitted those ships as whaling vessels. Killer whales used to eat whales. They would jump up on them until they drowned them and then they would eat them. And because we removed the whales, they shifted over and ate pinnipeds. They ate sea lions and walruses and things. And they worked their way all the way down until they got to these tiny little sea otters. Um, and so something that happened in the 1940s caused the crash of kelp beds in the 2000s. I think this is similar, okay? Um, so, what I want to emphasize is that we quit 
waving our arms and wringing our hands about bad things happening, and we say, what can we do? One, we can protect diversity of fishes and corals, but there's probably certain ones that are really important and some that are less so. So we don't have to have people in developing countries starve to death, okay? Um, you know, coral diversity, same. Sea cucumbers, these things taste crappy. Why in the world? And, you know, and, and also the one we're working with has almost no commercial value. And so just let's, let's put those back in, okay? Um, the bottom line is I think if we understand biotic functions and which ones are particularly important, we can go in and make little tweaks that don't cost a lot. Let's culture sea cucumbers, ones that are not valuable so people don't come in and steal them, and put them out on these reefs where we're trying to regrow corals. That's not working very well, by the way. Um, you know, so I'm hoping, I don't think this will overcome all the effects of global change. I think it will give us another 30 or 50 years or something to, to work on. It's insurance. And, you know, if your bank account's getting very low, and I'm afraid ours is, every little bit helps. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't think that it's enough to do just conservation. I think we have to intervene. Okay, in other words, you want anti-cancer medications if you get cancer. I think sea cucumbers can be anti-cancer medication for corals in certain areas, and it's not costly. It can, it can help. Um, I don't think there's anything special about coral reefs. I bet you could make this same argument for forests and for grasslands and for the intertidal. You know, there are particular things that matter and there are others that are less important, okay? Um, any questions? I'm done. Thank you, Mark. Okay. Any questions? If you're shy to speak English, I can translate. Nicola, yeah. go ahead. Uh, just out of curiosity, um, what caused that 30% loss on the coral reefs for the Great Barrier in Australia in 2015? It, it was heat. heat. Global change, yeah, global warming. And so you start getting corals bleaching when you get more than about six weeks of one temp one degree above normal. We had 10 months of more than that in the Pacific in 2015-16. And so the, the rate at which we're getting those unusually high temperatures has increased fivefold in the last 40 years. So we're, we're heating the world and the corals can't take that at present. Now, I will also say, when we're doing these experiments where we're out planting the corals and, and watching them die, if we have a cold front that comes through, we're, these things are racing along and we're thinking, oh, we're getting lots of data, this is great. And the water temperature drops by a degree, they just sit there for a week. And I'm going like, come on, die. You know, I want data. And then it warms up again and they go quicker. So I think there's an interaction between heat and these disease organisms. There are a number of them that are heat activated and that turn on pathogenicity at a certain temperature. And so again, it's not, is it this or is it that? It's often yes, and there's an interaction and we need to know about those. Does that answer your question? Okay, thank you. Yeah. So you talk a little about the microbes that might be involved in the multi drugs. Um, yeah. I'm not sure it's microbes. Yeah, yeah, we are not yeah. sure. But I want I just, my question is like these microbes, if they are like bad, bad or good for corals. I, the, I think the microbes that are killing the ones in the sediment, if it's microbes, mm -hmm. I'm assuming that it is, uh, and we're, we're doing some things literally right now. I've got a postdoc and a student there, and I hope to more, know more in a week when I get back. Um, those, are, those are bad. 
I am very worried that, that what a lot of the microbiome stuff right now is looking at sort of community organization and it's changing. And so you say, oh, it's bad. We don't always see that. We see some bad things happening with very little change. And so I'm, I'm concerned that there are, just like every other community I know, that there are a few actors that might be there as 1%, and they may be killing the coral, and the other 99% are just responding to that. And so it's, it's very hard for us to pull out What's a cause and what's an effect? I understand. Yeah. But uh, when you put like three species, species of coral yeah. at the same bowl, um, do you believe maybe it's possible that they are changing microbes between them in order to, to stay healthy? We're not seeing that obviously in the microbiome. The microbiomes of, of that, in other words, when we do those scatter plots, they, they group differently, okay? The species group with each other. That doesn't mean that there's not one or two microbes that are really important that are changing around, because that's not going to change that community composition significantly. And so, and because there's a thousand of them, there's always a couple of significant differences in there. I don't know whether that's important or whether that's sampling artifact. And it drives me nuts, okay? Because I can't answer that the way I want. I can't answer your question, which is a very good question, okay? I understand. Yeah. But it's something that we... It's something we I should be working on. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And even, you know, the, the other thing is people are not just describing microbiomes anymore. They're looking at what what pathways are upregulated, and but I'm still not sure what that tells us because sometimes, like we've just done a review, and over half of all the papers that talk about microbiome changes killing corals never never study the coral. They're just looking at microbiomes of the water column and saying we're seeing pathogenicity upregulated. I'm going against what? You know, is it against seaweeds? Is it against corals? Does it do anything to the corals? And, and if it does, is it successful? I mean, lions go out and hunt every day. They're only successful 17% of the hunts. You know, so if you just say you've turned on pathogenicity, was it successful or did the coral fight it off? Or did it really have anything to do with the coral? But what about the colloquium? Uh, yeah. that corals are, are, you know, they are all of your own, so they yeah. work together. Yeah, they, they, we think they do. We know that they do with the, the zooxanthellae. I think they do with the microbiome. I think it's really important, but I, I can't do the, ex I mean, there's going to be a lot of microbes on there that are just there. There's organics around and they're doing stuff. There's going to be some others that are really important. They're metabolizing sulfur. They're making antibiotics that protect the coral. Which ones are those? And what about yeah. the cucumbers? What are they doing? What? What are cucumbers are doing with corals? Well, the, yeah, I, they're... <laughs> Not yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. We can, we can, we can do this later. But I, I think that that we know that they are drawing down organics from the sediment, and we know that they're eating certain bacteria. From in order, we can look on the front end at what they're eating, and we can look at the back end of what comes out of that. And they are dramatically reducing cyanobacteria. Um, they're reducing some other species. Some stuff goes through just fine. Okay. Yeah. Can you expand a little on the cucumber? Uh, anyhow, um, I got the impression that maybe the cu cucumbers could have a diversity that matters as well. But we are not too sure about it, right? Since they've yep. been over harvested for a while. Yep. Do you think maybe corals could have adapted to this, to this lack of the cu cucumbers? It depends on the corals. In other words, let's say we've, we've over-harvested them for 60 years. 
some corals are reproducing monthly, so that would be a lot of generations, and some are 400 years old that are out there now, and they haven't done much. They haven't turned, you know, the population um, hadn't changed much in genetics of that time period. I'm, I'm concerned that a lot of these foundation species of trees and corals and things that live for long periods of time, that the ones that really build the structure are, are not going to be able to respond rapidly enough. Now, I can't, I can't guarantee that that's the case, but I'm, I'm worried about that. You know, there's very strong selection on some of these. In other words, if we look at babies, baby corals on the reefs in those overfish places, and you look at the, the genotypic variants, it's large. If you look at it for corals that are that big, it's very small. Okay, so in other words, most of those that come in do not have the genetic architecture to be able to live in that situation. Now, that's strong selection. So over time, that could work, but it could also just mean that they're far enough apart from each other now at such low density that they don't successfully reproduce because they're throwing out babies in, you know, sperm and egg and trying to do it externally for most of them. Yeah. 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 <laughs> now, I was thinking, Mark, about like, how to recover the destructive areas. Mm -hmm. Because like in your paper, by the way, it was a beautiful lecture, but you show some of the contribution. I also agree that it's a, it's a combination of uh, factors mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. you drive the coral out. Yeah. Microbiome, and like you can turn the bad guys into, the good yeah. guys into the bad yeah. guys. Yeah, yeah, Fishes, cucumbers, and like temperature, yeah. everything. But how can we use this, if you have any data, to recover, recover the damaged areas? Yeah. Because for me, it's clear what we should do to try to slow down the destruction, at least to counteract yeah. a little bit the global change that I think oh, lost yeah. the war, because yeah. it will be hard to... Yeah, yeah. So, I, you know, I would argue that some of these things are very actionable right now. In other words, we can, uh, people are growing acroperid corals in, like in the Caribbean, they're, they're growing those on these, um, they grow them on, on like telephone wires almost that are hanging back in the back reef area and, and they grow fine, grow great. And then they transplant them out on the reef and they live for one to three years and they die from the base up with this white band, just like we're seeing in Fiji. And maybe that's because we removed all the sea cucumbers and instead of just transplanting them out, maybe we should protect certain sea cucumbers and transplant them in those areas. Because I think a lot of times it's, it were, if, if you went on vacation and you came back to Sao Paulo and everybody was dead, would you take babies and put them out in the street to recover? I mean, that's what we're doing with coral reefs. In other words, something killed hundreds of millions of corals in the Caribbean, and now we're putting 50 or 1,000 back out there until we fix whatever killed them. We're just, yeah, you know. We sort of oversimplify when we try to do it's yeah. like the forest. It's like you put yeah. there one species and you're trying yeah. to recoup the forest. Yeah. You're never going to yeah. make it. Yeah. So. Well, and so I think on like on the coral outplants, I think they need to outplant them as multiple species, not, mm -hmm. not one. And they're doing that in, I think it's the Philippines, and getting more growth and more survivorship. So that's helping. Um, I think, you know, this sea cucumber thing can help that work even better. I bet there's 10 other things like that that we don't know yet. Um, but, you know, I've, I've wanted to do something with sea cucumbers for 20 years, and I've never been at a place where there were enough of them 
that you could ask this question. And when we got to Murray, it was like, oh, you know, <laughs> let's do this. And, um, you know, this, this seaweed thing is a big problem. These sargassum and stuff floating in, I mean, I don't know what's going on with that either. I mean, I know what's going on locally, but I don't know why the whole sargasso sea has increased the amount of sargassum hugely. And do you guys get big rafts of that coming into Brazil? Like, of sargassum? Big? Yes. We, yeah. we have a paper published uh, we, we, in our network. Yeah, okay. In Fernando de Noronha. Okay. Huge one. Yeah. I think yeah. it was in 2018. Okay. Okay, so you know, there's there's a lot of the the resort Caribbean islands are having front loaders and dump trucks that they go down every day and scoop this off the beach. Not you know? common in the coast. I think yeah. we okay. this one in the ocean in the our oceanic islands. Okay, okay. Well, in in Belize, the last time I was there, maybe th four years ago, um, the mangroves on the offshore islands were getting killed. 20 meters back into the mangroves because the sargassum was that deep, just piling in and causing it to all go anaerobic. So it's that's a big deal. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. And there is a lot of chemistry still to find mm -hmm. out, right? Well, it is, and it's also, it would be wonderful if, if we could find some product, if you could feed sargassum to cows and they grew twice as fast or something you know but mm -hmm. to use to make it usable so people go take it they, they are trying to do some probiotics i know i know to corals, right to give like some <laughs> yeah, <cool. laughs> yeah yeah they are i i i'm worried about whether that can work given that they're they're not in a lab they're out in the real ocean I'm not very enthusiastic with this yeah yeah too. we for uh, there are a number of papers that talk about unhealthy reefs the corals have this unhealthy microbiome and a number of those papers if you go in the back and you read the uh, methods very carefully they're not looking at coral microbiomes they're looking at water microbiomes that are within five centimeters of the bottom and if we do that in those protected and unprotected areas, that water microbiome is very different, just like these papers say it mm -hmm. is. The coral microbiomes of three species that we've looked at are indistinguishable. They're the same in the healthy area as they are in the terrible area. By community composition, there's a few more vibrios, like 0.1, 0.2% in the damaged areas that might be making coral sick. That might be enough. I don't know. And I also think that they turn on like biosynthetic yeah. gen clusters yeah. and start to produce, you don't yeah. necessarily has to change the bacteria community yeah. to yeah. make something. You can, you can, you can turn on, yeah. Yes, just you, can have, differently. you can have them do different things, right. Yeah. And, but it, it, if, if microbiomes are really important for corals, then corals are gonna regulate those microbiomes. Now, we might push it to a place where they can't successfully do that. In other words, we regulate our temperature and we get infections and pathogens change that. You know, So that could happen on corals too. But on the corals themselves, if they're healthy, if they look okay and they're in really different environments, we don't see dramatic changes in the microbiome of the coral. We see dramatic changes in the water around them. But, you know, if other people get other, other results, it, that may be context-specific some way. Maybe in this place it does it and then it doesn't. I don't know. I work with bacteria and yeah. microbiome, but I think it's that oversimplification. Yes. To try to to, answer big questions looking just with just it. community composition is not going to answer yeah. this. No, and yeah. it, it also even in metabolites, yeah. it, it's a very complex system. It's Absolutely. like trying to to find like the the, <clears throat> the whole the carcinogenic process, trying to, to yeah. see what's going on with your microbiota yeah. in your gut. Yeah. Yeah. 
So it's it's well, it's like it would be like you, yeah, it would be like you grinding up the Amazon looking for a cancer drug. Yes. You know, the whole Amazon at once, not individual plants. You you've got to be able to look individually at some level and at their dynamics, how they can make compound X when they're competing, but not when they're not, or when there's a predator there, but not when they're not. And very suspicious, like to this miracle anti-cancer drug. You know, when they tell me that I find, I read something about miracle drug to yeah, yeah, cancer. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, 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 you read things all the time. I yes. mean, you, you know this as well. I It's constant in the US that you'll hear some radio story or something about somebody has found a new new compound that kills cancer cells. So, yeah, we got thousands of those. Yes, we do. <laughs> and they kill people too. You know, it's, it's yeah. No, but I think your approach is really nice because you approach as a health problem. As well. A, as a environmental health yeah, problem. Yeah. It's not only the coral, but it's yeah. the sea cucumber, it's the fish. Yeah, we it's need... the microbiota, it's everything. Yeah. Because yeah. it's a complex system that must yeah. work. And so are we. Yes. You know, and, and we know that from, um, you know, systems biology and stuff. Yes. It, it's very, the context is important. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I won't keep you guys forever. Thank you very much. Um, so let's thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, thank you. <laughs>